discipline or a subdiscipline uh, because the initial reaction is, oh, that's weird, as opposed to, of course, natural selection should favor all organisms. To In particular, there is an issue things that our plants are doing that aren't consistent with what we believe plants can do. And so he wasn't looking at mimosa specifically, he was looking at twining behavior and root growth and phototropisms and all these other movement things. But the whole context of this was challenging the idea that plants are insensitive to the local environment, challenging the idea that plants were simply deterministic um, machines in response to the environment. More recently, there's been a number of papers that are switching the terminology around. I'm on some of these, I'm not on other ones, but the underlying theme of what you're coming, you'll see here is behavior, behavior, behavior. And so uh, the, the most influential of these papers was by John Silverton and Deborah Gordon, and Deborah Gordon was an insect behaviorist, uh, and this is 1989, they published a framework for studying plant behavior, and they were beginning to approach this idea that maybe we should um, bring behavioral ecology into the study of plants. And then, this is a paper I just recently wrote a couple months ago, um, and that's what these other papers are really getting at, is we need to stop saying plants are like animals. It's, it's not a useful um, phrase. Instead, we can ask, are there general rules of behavior that organisms should follow, regardless of whether they're plants or animals? Are there general underlying theories, principles, and models that work through natural selection to affect predictable outcomes, or instead, is how organisms deal with the environment truly taxonomically restricted? There's no doubt the physiology of these organisms is greatly different, but are the deeper rules causing relationships to the environment actually differ? And this brings us to two well-known people, Nico Tinbergen on the left and Ernst Meyer on the right. And for those of you who study or have studied animal behavior, you'll know both of these people quite well. They were really influential in unifying in the 1960s or so uh, some disparate areas of research related to animal behavior. And what was going on at the time is that you had some individuals studying these highly reductionist, detailed uh, mechanisms of how animals responded to their local environment and social interaction interaction, we call these approximate mechanisms. So we could think of that as the physiology. And then you had the evolutionary biologists who are asking these other questions of the ultimate causation. What are the reasons behind why an animal should have these sorts of mechanisms? And this was a big divide in the 60s, and in the 50s and 60s, among researchers were saying, well, this is behavior, that's not behavior. And what they argued is it's all part of it, that behavior is integrative of these proximate details 
as well as the ultimate causations. And if we actually want to understand the biology of an organism, we can't focus on part of the story. We have to understand the big questions and the small questions. And where plants come into this is plant biologists have been incredibly successful in understanding the detailed physiology of the organism. The green revolution, current crop breeding programs, all of the biotechnology, it is because we as a discipline have an incredible understanding of how plants operate at a very proximate level. But what we don't have is an understanding of the why. We just, as a group of scientists, we just haven't studied that. We study evolution in plants, but we don't study the evolution behind the proximate mechanisms that are driving processes, complex processes in plants anywhere like animal biologists have done. Animal biologists have been going on both prongs for a very long time. Plant biologists, for no good reason, just historical um, patterns, have ignored a whole aspect of organismal biology, which I'm going to argue has really given us a false understanding of what plants are. And to bring it more full circle, there's huge application involved with the behavioral side of plants that has been missing from the biotechnology side, if one wants to go that way. So I'm going to talk about two main components. I'm going to come back to Mimosa pudica. It's one of the lab organisms that we do quite a lot. And I actually use that a lot uh, with my um, undergraduates. It's a very good plant to work with, uh, with undergraduates. It, it does move. Um, and you can measure it. We've developed some behavioral assays for it that, that are, work very well within the context of an academic research course. Uh, and very little research has actually ever been done with this plant other than the physiologists have gone after. There are no muscle fibers, but it is an electrical signal that is causing this to happen. But nobody's really asking any of the ecology of the system. So we've been doing quite a lot with Mimosa over the last couple of years. And I'll just briefly summarize that. And we can put an end to the concept that plants don't express sensitivity. What I want to spend more time on is where on this line of research, my lab is more active, which is looking at root foraging behavior. And so this is more explicitly bring in some foraging models, um, animals, and understanding that there's deeply complex um, information integration, social con contingencies, and other processes going on in the soil. And, and I'll talk a little bit, as time permits, about where this is going. Many of my talks, I focus on theory after theory, experimental test after experimental test. This one's going to be a little different. I'm going to show a lot of results. I'm going to show a lot of what plants are actually doing, because that fairly represents where we are in this field of plant behavioral ecology. We really don't know what plants are capable of. Uh, not because there haven't been clever people who study plants. It's just we just haven't asked the question. And so a lot of what my lab does is we go through just basic questions and behaviors from the 50s, 60s, and 70s and test them in plants. Can they ex follow the marginal value theorem? Can they do prey choice? Can they do these sorts of things? Uh, and, and so that's sort of what I want to show is some of the things we're finding they do. And I'll start with mimosa. So this is mimosa pudica. Leaves open, leaves closed, same plant. That's, this is called the sensitive plant for obvious reasons, as I showed you in the quick video. Um, the argument for why they do this is generally this is viewed as a behavioral defense against um, herbivores. And a few things happen when this leaf closes. And that leaf does close within seconds to milliseconds, depending on the type of um, touch that it receives. Um, one thing that is there's evidence for is it does make spines on these branches more visible when the leaves are retracted. And so one potential benefit of this leaf closure is actually to enhance the effectiveness of morphological defenses, such as spininess. But it's also thought that a bigger effect is that it decreases the appearance of the leaves, and it makes the plant not look like as good of a forage for an animal. So a lot of how animals deal with pollinators and herbivores is to modify animal behavior through changing costs and benefits of attacking a given plant. And this is thought to be the big effect. It just does not necessarily look as good a forage as this would. And browsers are a very common herbivore of these plants in natural systems. And the other possibility, we've done some experimental trials with this, is it can dislodge insects. So if you put a little caterpillar on a leaf and let it eat, and then the leaf closes, that caterpillar can fall off. 
It doesn't happen all the time, but it, it can happen more than zero. Um, so as I said, there's substantial work on the proximate mechanisms. We know exactly what's going on of how these close and how these reopen. It does involve electrical signals. But there's been almost no work in describing the overall biology of the behavior of opening and closing. And what we've done is we've focused on one particular aspect of this. And what we measure as our behavioral assay is in response to a touch stimuli, how long does it take for that leaf to reopen? So a very simple behavioral assay, any behavioral study you need something to measure. And what we noticed in obs observing these over the years is that there's lots of variation among individuals and among contexts and how quickly the leaves will reopen. Some will reopen in a couple minutes, some may take 10 minutes. You can imagine how exciting it is for an undergraduate to sit next to some mimosa plants and stopwatch counting how long it takes for these leaves to reopen, but that's the glamour of ecological research. And so a lot of my, all the data on this is gonna really be focused on leaf reopening. And I want you to think of reopening as a way of no longer hiding. So if that leaf is closed, we can see this analogous to hiding. If that leaf is open, it's fully exposed to herbivores. The other thing that's going to be important is that when these leaves are closed, uh, they are less efficient at photosynthesis. So staying closed reduces photosynthesis by at least 40%, and it might be more than that, meaning there is an energetic cost to staying hidden. And so you would only expect that those plants would stay hidden if the benefits of being closed outweigh the loss of photosynthesis. So that'll become important. So the first we're doing is just natural history. We are just, this is uh, undergraduate uh, Tiana Barber Cross, and she's, the summers went out and just measured lots of stuff. And let me just walk you through some of the things of just describing the behavior. First thing I'll say is we've tested for repeatability. The repeatability of this behavior with an individual is about 30 something percent, depending on what exactly we're measuring. And that's relevant because it's exactly the average repeatability in meta-analyses of animal behavioral studies. So the repeatability of this plant behavior is as repeatable as most animal behaviors. So it's not different. It is just the, what the repeatability tends to be. This is looking at the leaf age, and this is how long it takes to open, as I've written it here. So these are leaves that reopen fast and reopen slow. This is just simply saying that there's a developmental stage to this behavior. Older leaves stay hidden longer than do young leaves. There's nothing revolutionary about this other than saying development is involved or there's a differential allocation of the defense. This is looking at time of day, and I've switched the axis now to the rate of reopening, so higher is faster. In the middle of the day, um, these plants reopen faster than in the morning or late afternoon, so they're groggy at the tails of the day, they open more in the middle of the day. The blue line is actually plants in the shade. They show less of a diurnal cycle. The red plants the red one, are in full sun. They show a, a more pronounced diurnal cycle. This was one of the meanest things I did to my undergrad this summer is she had to be out there an hour before sunrise and hour after sunset in the you know, eight, 16 hours of sunlight days measuring these plants all day. But they show a diurnal cycle. And then this one is just in a field experiment we did showing that plants in the shade reopen faster than plants in the sun. And I'm gonna come back to that, but that's a little counterintuitive. So a plant that's in shaded areas actually hides less than a plant in sun. And this is actually gonna turn out to fit exactly a very well-known animal behavioral prediction. Uh, other bits of natural history. Uh, this is a horribly ugly graph. But if we just look at this, this dot versus this dot, this is how long to reopen. So they hide longer than here. These are leaves that were undamaged. These were leaves that we damaged right before we measured them. So damaging a leaf changes the behavior, but that settles down. These differences tend to dissipate uh, over the course of the week. And so a damaged leaf doesn't lose its ability to behave normally, but it is disrupted for a short period of time. And this was on the leaf we damaged. The leaf below it um, doesn't really show much of a response other than right away, and that's only important because this is saying that the changes to the leaf's behavior with damage are very localized. It's not a systemic response. And so each leaf has the potential to respond very differently. And this is something animal 
biologists don't really have to deal with, where if you damage a paw, you don't really look at is the other paw also behaving differently. But in leaves, you can have systemic and, in, and localized uh, behavioral responses. Coming back to the sunlight, this is an old theory from uh, Larry Dill, who's a co-author of this. He was a former professor at Simon Fraser. And he worked in a beautiful field sites in the South Pacific, and one of the things he worked on were dugongs and tiger sharks. And what he would find is that when the dugongs were starving, they would always forage in the high quality parts of the water, even though that's where the tiger sharks hung out. But when the dugongs were well fed, they avoided the areas of the dugongs. And this is a really common behavioral response in animals is that animals tend to take more risks to, of predation when their body condition is low and less risk when their body condition is high. So they tend to uh, take risk if starving. We decided to test that with mimosa plant, and this is, comes back to the light, because you asked the question, how, how might you starve a plant? Well, you give it shade. So this is the amount of sunlight the plants receive. These are plants that are in low light conditions versus high light conditions versus time to reopen. These plants in the high light conditions stay hidden longer than the plants in the low light conditions, analogous to the sunshade I showed before. This prediction is exactly consistent with the animal models coming out of the animal behaviorist lab of you stay hidden if you can afford not to eat. If you can afford to have a photosynthesis uh, reduced, you, you don't need to forage as much. Importantly, the plant physiologists predicted the exact opposite relationship. The plant physiology model predicts that the leaves should stay open longest, or, or should open fastest under high light. Because this is an ATP-dependent ATP dependent process. It takes a lot of energy uh, to reopen these leaves. And so those leaves under high energy status should be able to reopen fastest. And so we find a response in the biology of these leaves that is exactly consistent with animal behavioral theory and exactly opposite of plant physiology theory. And so this is one of the first cues we had in the lab that maybe a purely proximate focus of how plants work is missing something bigger. And if this hiding represents a balance between the costs of loss photosynthesis and the benefits of reduced potential enemy attack, your predictions are going to differ than if you're focused only on energy and ignoring these other aspects of what the plants are doing. We've played around with this a little bit more. This is a paper we had out just last year. We, this is one of the scariest apparatuses we've ever created. These are open wheels with a band that had, uh, basically this is, a, this is just a lab glove with the fingers dangling down. And we had it whip around these plants. I did, unfortunately, um, have one student's hair who tangled on this one. That was very unfortunate. We put in a modification after that. Um, but, well, she got a haircut. Anyway, on the, um, what we did is we set up different apparatuses to have these hit plants at different times, basically during the day and night. Because we're really now focused on the cost. And if you're closed, you can't photosynthesize. And so maybe plants respond a little different to day and night. And so we, again, we're controlling for light because light messes everything up, as I showed before. We again find the same positive relationship between light levels and time to reopen. But we see that the leaves opened in the day, uh, that are touched in the day, actually stay closed longer than leaves that are touched at night. So if the plant is touched in the same amount of touch between these treatments, the assay is done at the same time in both of these plants. But if they had been previously touched in the day, they stay hidden longer than night. We don't have an explanation for why. It might be related to some cues of wind versus animals. We have no idea. But we know the timing of touch matters. And even more importantly, if we look at fitness consequences, this is the size of the plant versus reproductive size, we find plants that are touched day or night are simply bigger than untouched plants. And this is weird. But this happens in a lot of plant studies. Touching plants often makes them bigger. This is known in the horticultural world, where a lot of horticultural production greenhouses will actually move burlap over plants, and it, may, it increases growth. Nobody knows why, um, why this actually happens. We know how plants respond. We have the proximate mechanisms. We know that. 
we don't have any ultimate reasons of why touch is better, but I will say, in a natural system, plants are never untouched. The natural state for a plant is to be out in the wind. And so the real treatment here is removal of a stimuli rather than an addition of stimuli. And when you take away a natural stimuli, their growth goes down. But importantly, if we're looking at the cost of behavior, this is where we find a big difference between the day and night. The daytime touch plants had a much lower fitness than the nighttime touch plants. And so that touching behavior, which is causing the lo loss photosynthesis through closing it during the day, corresponded to a reduction in fitness, um, but it didn't happen at night. So touch itself didn't damage the plants. It was touch during day coupled with the um, loss photosynthesis that had a negative consequence. So the take home from this part really simply is that the mimosa is doing repeatable patterns. And light keeps popping up as a really important component of this. It's, it's having this hiding in response to a uh, high light uh, relationship that we expect from behavioral theory. We think we're identifying a cost to this behavior under some context than the others. Um, behavioral theory can explain this, but this really is mostly natural history that we're doing with this plant right now, and there's just not much done. Like, the biggest question out there is, is this actually a defense? There's not a single study ever showing leaf closure changes actual attack. This is a, I've been doing some field work with a related species in Florida, and this is a, a mimosa plant, and this is a caterpillar sitting on the mimosa with a closed leaf chewing it just perfectly fine. And importantly, you might see there's other leaves right below it that are wide open. And so for this plant, it's all the same plant, it seems to have no defensive function, which comes back to that, that maybe this is really about browsers and not insects. And maybe it's more about the hiding. There's a thousand questions we could ask, but more natural history needs to be done on the actual uh, function of this, which is a big hole in this literature. Uh, we have done a little bit of work, and I haven't presented it, trying to link this into overall defensive strategies. This leaf closing behavior, even if it is a defense, it's not the only one. There's, there's also all sorts of chemical defenses and morphological defenses, and trying to link this into general behavioral theory is another area that we're trying to get into. But what I am comfortable saying is um, mimosa, at least, expresses a good deal of sensitivity in response to a variety of things that you expect things to be sensitive to. What I want to spend the last chunk of this time talking about are roots and finding food in a patchy landscape. So if you're, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say lazy, but if you're lazy, um, you might study grizzly bears and you look at their food foraging. And this is one of my wife's papers who studies grizzly bears and looked at foraging. Um, and it's very simple to do animal behavior. All you have to do is go out there, you catch a bear, you put a collar on it, you sit at your home office, and you get all this data coming in about where bear the bear went. It's pretty um, simple. Uh, wherever the bear moves, its mouth moves. And this bear only has one mouth. And so wherever the body is tells you everything you need to know about the habitat it's living in. And you can generate these resource selection functions or some other map about how long the plant, or not the plant, how long the bear uh, spends time as a function of habitat stuff. If you want to do something more complicated, you might look at roots. And so one of the problems with roots is that there's a whole lot of them, and they live in an opaque substrate. So you can't see them. You can't GPS collar each root tip. And there might be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of root tips per individual plant. And to make it even more complicated, each of these root tips might be foraging quasi-independently. They may be making individual decisions at the root tip level, but all of that has to be integrated through natural selection at the level of the individual. And so there's actually a lack of models of how this type of behavior should work. We still don't know what is the, is it a swarming type behavior? Is it some other type of behavioral model of how to explain how you can have individual decisions integrated to the individual. And so there are some challenges practically and conceptually that I haven't resolved, but nobody's resolved yet, 
but it's, it is one of the areas where plant biology may actually contribute to behavioral ecology as well. I'm going to focus a lot on where this plant puts its roots in the soil and what decisions it makes as a function of the distributions of other things in the soil to understand the basic foraging rules. And this really is going to be 1970s behavioral ecology, coming back to marginal value theorem and some basic patch selection mo models. And the idea is that plants live in a patchy world like everything. The only time resources are not distributed patchily are flooding events and agricultural crop runs. So let's ignore the flooding events. Those are fairly rare relative to other things. But croplands are, again, one of these extraordinarily weird artificial environments. It's not just because it's a monoculture, but it's creating a landscape of resource distributions that plants have no evolutionary path with. And so we need to ask the question of how do plants actually deal with patchiness? What do they do? Early work in the 1970s was very elegant in hydroponics. These were containers that were divided into three parts. And the researchers just put different amounts of nutrients in the different parts. These three, are, uh, these three are the most important ones here. They added phosphate, nitrate, or ammonium to the middle part, not the top or the bottom part. And what you can see is the plants, they did this on a variety of crop species, they put more roots where the food was. This is a very, very common response that foods do not grow roots. Nope. Plants do not grow roots evenly. They grow roots as a function of where the patches of food are. It's, it's rational in the sense of natural selection as a rational player. It's, they've developed mechanisms to ex exploit high quality patches over low quality patches. And there's tons of optimal foraging theory to support this. We did a meta-analysis a while ago uh, looking at what we can call this precision. So how precise were plants in putting pa roots in patches? A precision of 0.5 would correspond that they were agnostic with respect to resource conditions. They just grew roots evenly. Higher than 0.5 means they showed preferential root growth in high quality patches. Of the 120 species we tested, nearly every one showed increased root growth in nutrient patches. In other words, the normal thing for plants to do is to forage in a non-random way. They, the normal is plants will put their roots in high quality patches over low quality back, back background soil. It's obvious that they should do it through natural selection. I don't even need to explain it. But it's not intuitive. Year after year in my plant ecology class, when I ask students to draw a root system on the board, just draw me a hypothetical root system, they're always symmetric. But they're not symmetric. Root systems are not symmetric because of this fine scale behavior. So that's fine, not horribly interesting. This is a big, messy ordination. Um, this is foraging precision here with a whole sorts of plant traits. What I want to just say here, what we've done some work with, is that this foraging precision isn't this random thing that plants do, but it fits in general life history strategies of plants. And most importantly, like animal biologists are doing too, moving, uh, classifying things on a slow, fast life continuum. Precision, the ability to exploit high quality patches, is associated with other traits in plants ex associated with a fast lifestyle, a weedy lifestyle, a ruderal lifestyle, depending on what wordings you use. So fast growth rates, high nitrogen content, these sorts of things are associated with this particular behavior, which is leading to some research trying to integrate behavioral strategies into overall plant strategies and functional traits, trying to look to integrate some research decisions. This is looking at wheat. Uh, this is just data from this summer. It's very, very rough. Um, but I just want to show that the consequences of nutrient patches, patchiness can be variable. So we have an experiment with 220 different cultivars of wheat. And we've introduced patchiness into a cropland in areas that aren't patchiness. And this is just looking at height differences near the patch versus far from the patch. All I want you to see is that this line isn't perfectly flat. In fact, there's a lot of significantly different values away from non, not caring. Uh, and there's significant variation among cultivars, which is actually showing that there's genetic difference in the consequence of patchiness for um, at least this species, I have a poor, poor graduate student who collected 6,000 soil cores this summer, and she has, uh, we're estimating, about eight full-time months of root washing ahead of her to, to look at the root foraging behavior. But where we're going with this is, uh, because this is a fully pedigreed population, 
we're going to be able to look at the evolution of this behavior within this species. And, and we have a gene map too, and we could identify some of the genes that are responsible for this behavior um, in a way that we, we can't do with many other populations. But let's go back to some of the other answers. This is a study uh, and where we were explicitly testing the marginal value theorem. And the marginal value theorem is a very foundational model in animal behavioral ecology. And the punchline of the model is that animals should stay longer in high quality patches than low quality patches. In other words, you leave when, uh, just before the food's up. And if there's less food, you leave earlier than if there's a lot of food. So we wanted to ask this question of whether plants do the same thing. If they find a high quality patch, will they stay in that patch longer than if they have a low quality patch. And so we created some experimental arenas. This was a, um, a study where we have some plywood boxes. We put a camera down the middle so we can observe root growth. We have a plant in the middle of the box. We either put a high quality patch or a low quality patch next to the plant and the opposite type of the patch further away. So this would experience high then low, low then high or we create this artificial landscape of homogeneous resource distributions which doesn't occur outside of cropland. And just by observing the root growth over time, we're able to test the prediction of whether this plant will slow down its root growth when it comes to high first or low first. The physiology prediction is that when a plant encounters high um, nutrients, it should increase its growth rate. It may not have more roots, but it should become overall bigger. And so the prediction of the physiologist was that increased resource availability should lead to faster root growth out of the patch. The behavioral prediction from marginal th theorem is the opposite of that. So what do we actually see? This is root growth in a high quality patch. We'll just look at the side towards the patch versus when it has a high patch first versus low patch first the plant roots slow down when they hit the high quality patch. So the plants grew f roots much further when they had a low quality patch first than if they had a high quality patch first. In other words, they stayed, they had longer residence time in the higher quality patch, exactly again like the animal behavioral theory. The interesting bit is what happened in the homogenous soil. In that world with no patches, they barely grew any roots. And so again, I said before that this cropland homogenous world is weird, similar to like a world without wind, without touch. It's a weird world. The plants don't follow the animal behavioral theory. We would expect them in this world with low quality soil that's homogenous to actually have the most extensive root system. And instead they hunker down and they don't, they just don't grow their roots. And so the agricultural implications of this are huge. Because if you're working with a crop plant that does this, you're gonna have very concentrated root systems which could be good or bad depending on how you're putting your nutrients into that system. And so this is saying that the timing of root growth is itself highly dependent on the spatial distribution, distribution of nutrients in that system. It does appear there's some fitness or uh, growth consequences but we don't really need to get into that. This is a horrible graph. You don't even need to look at the figure. Uh, but in contrast to response to nutrient patches, where nutrient patches, most plants exploit patches, in response to neighbors, there's great variability in what plants do. Any values above this line are species which grow roots preferentially towards a neighboring plant. So it's an aggressive behavior. So this could be considered a shy, aggressive continuum from the animal behavioral world. These are aggressive plants that grow roots towards a neighbor. These are the shy plants that grow roots away from the neighbor. So we can classify plants based on this shy, aggressive continuum, just like we can do with animal behaviors, and they express uh, variations across this whole spectrum. We can put this stuff together, and that's the last bits I'll talk about here. Um, and it's recognizing that none of the factors that I've talked about in terms of roots happen in isolation. Plants do have neighbors, they have herbivores, they have mutualists, they have abiotic stressors. And all of these things, if we're talking about animal behavior, you would integrate into a resource selection function or some larger habitat use model, recognizing that animals don't typically make behavioral decisions based on single factors on the landscape. 
they're gonna somehow integrate information and that's gonna result in the ultimate expression of the behavior of the animal. And so that's the last bits of studies I wanna talk about that are showing some evidence of animation and that this work is gonna come from. These are our experimental arenas that we've created. These are our botanical rat mazes. Uh, and they're just plexiglass with, that are very thin, about three to five millimeters of soil is between two areas of uh, plexiglass, allowing us to root growth and we realized measuring roots was really hard. So working with some engineers, what we did instead of measuring roots is we measured the movement of 10,000 particles in the soil and the displacement. And from that displacement, we would be able to measure a strain map. And so here, areas of red are areas of soil that moved really rapidly over a short period of time versus areas that not. We glued nutrient beads here, we did not over here. So you can actually see these behavioral processes over a very short time scale using a different approach rather than the root. So the experiment is very simple. We know that they make decisions. The sunflower really puts its roots in high nutrient patches. We wanted to ask whether stress matters. We know from human psychology and a lot of animal behavioral studies that decision making processes in animals is often disrupted by stress and that people and many animals are literally less able to solve problems when stressed than non-stress and that is often transient. If the stress is released, the decision making ability comes down. So it's not just that you feel like you can't make a decision, you literally can't. Uh, uh, and that's a very, very common phenomenon. So we want to ask the same thing for this. We consider putting roots in the high quality patch relative to the low quality patch a decision. The plant could put those roots in either places. They have the ability to do that. They express one decision over the other. And we can look at that, how much they do that as the quality of decision. And our stressors, we're gonna cut off leaves, which would be pretty stressful. So these are plants in the unstressed environment, undamaged. The experiment started over here. This is just time since clipping. Um, and they were, the blue was the fertilized versus the unfertilized. This is just saying more root activity from our strain map in the fertilized soil than the unfertilized. They're making good decisions. Undamaged plants are preferentially putting roots in the high quality soil. No surprises there. Here's what our stress plants do. Our stress plants keep growing roots. So there's actually a significant positive slope. So they haven't stopped growing roots, but they grow them equally in the fertilized and unfertilized areas. So they've stopped making that decision. About 120 hours later, they go back and make the good decision again. So this stress disrupts the decision making process in a transient way. So again, this is exactly what animal behaviorists and human psychologists would sh say would, is a result of a discrete stress event. You have a disruption of decision making process that somehow gets resolved and the decision making process is reestablished. And so that's what we're finding the plants are doing here as well, which is crazy. So integrating these a little bit together, we'll move away from the, the discrete stressor of leaf clipping and look at a chronic stressor of neighbors. The old tall fences make good neighbors sort of issue. Um, so we can imagine a world where we have a patch and a plant, and we can look at its decision making. We could have two plants that have a shared patch. We could have two plants where the shared patch is actually, or this, the patch is actually closer to one than the other. And we could ask, so what all we've done, the only thing we've changed between these two treatments is the distribution of that nutrient, the location of the patch. We haven't changed patchiness, we haven't changed neighbor density. And we're asking if the spatial distribution between nutrients and neighbors matters to the behavioral expression of the plant root system. This is a nice, I like the, this, it's nice when I get a result that I don't need graphs for. This is what the plants did when they grow by themselves. You can see more root growth in the hot and the nutrient area than low. This is normal decision, I've shown this a thousand times. This is what they did when the patch was in between the two plants. You can see they actually reduced their use. So when that patch was shared between two or placed between two, and when that patch was on the other side of the plant from the neighbor, it overused it relative to what it did alone. We'd call this an anticipatory behavior. So when the plant had primary access to a nutrient patch, it exploited that patch more fully and more rapidly than it did when it was by itself. So it was, in other words, getting to the house on Halloween before the neighbors got there. It was emptying the jar. And it didn't, didn't do that in different contexts. 
So this is really showing a degree of information integration is going on in this case. Just one other example here of information into a different plant. This is a Budelon theophrasty one I used a long time ago. I was telling the grad students this is my $500 science paper. Um, and so this is an undergraduate project. And um, looking at a, a Budelon in a world with a patch in the middle or to the outside. This is just looking at this red bar is where it grew its roots. This plant actually is dumb. It grew its roots throughout the entire pot regardless of whether nutrients were homogenous or patchy. So I just want to show this counter example that this plant didn't concentrate its root growth in patches when it grew alone. When we grew it next to another plant, they completely avoided each other, even in a homogenous world. So this root growth greatly reduced and it reduced more than you can predict based on the size of the plant. So it's not simply there were two plants that's half as big, its root growth was trivial. There was some signal that they were responding to. But when you combine these, importantly here, the presence of a neighbor did not inhibit that plant from using a nutrient patch when it was available. So this is opposite what the sunflower did. They were actually overusing these patches relative to what they did in this treatment when there's a presence of a neighbor. So, and then they didn't quite do the same thing on the other side. So they're not, it's not the same result as sunflower, but it is again showing some contingency in these patch use decisions as a function of the social context of the plant, which is unusual. Plants can integrate a variety of other types of information. I alluded to this with the grad students as well. This is Arabidopsis thaliana, which a lot of people in the botanical world use. And we looked at the ability of this plant to recognize and respond to kin. And so what we did is we had a fertilized and unfertilized treatment, not patchy. This is just simply in pots with high or low fertilizer. And in the unfertilized world, when we added, changed their neighbor from kin to non-kin, it didn't matter. They all had about the same amount of competition. But that's not the case in the fertilized world. In the fertilized world, there was actually more competition with non-kin than with kin. Again, this comes straight out of animal behavioral theory. Uh, we know there's a lot of kin protection in a lot of animals. We also know that kin protection tends to break down under stressful conditions and low resource conditions. You're more likely to protect your kin when you're well um, provisioned than when you're not well provisioned. And so we're finding the same things in plants. When they were starved for resources, there was no kin protection. When they had abundant resources, they expressed a kin protection mechanism. I won't go into the details of this, but kin, we're following up on this in the lab right now, that kin recognition is a highly variable among genotypes, so we actually think we should be able to test questions about the evolution of kin recognition in this species, um, which would be nifty. So root foraging summary, root placement is influenced by the things you would expect to alter the behavior of a foraging organism. That really is the take home. Nothing I'm showing would be in any way novel or surprising if it wasn't in plants. They, I haven't shown a single behavioral response that isn't predicted by an existing animal behavioral theory, which I suggest really argues the need to incorporate animal behavioral thinking into plant biology. It just works. If we get away from the worrying about the proximate details of how they do this and focus more on what they're doing, there's great similarity between how organisms interact. The direction of these effects are consistent with common sense. Root behavioral outcomes are non-additive and do Im, uh, suggest some information integration. We don't have the proximate mechanisms of how they do this. We don't have the proximate mechanisms of that stress-induced decision-making. The f physiologists, when I talk to them, they have no idea. Well, they, I won't say they don't have any idea. They say, well, maybe auxins evolved, hormone cycling, plant leaf root signaling. So there's domains that probably are involved, but nobody's ever shown it before. And most of these are, this is the first time it's ever been shown that plants can do this. And so we, of course, we don't have approximate theory there. This disruption, the temporal disruption dis decision making, I think is particularly of interest potentially for agriculture or restoration or any other applied vegetation um, uh, project where if it is true that plants can find their own food in patches, great. If it's true that if they get damaged, they reduce their ability to find their food, it does raise questions about applying fertilizer immediately after 
a hailstorm or a wind event or just the timing of when you're applying food relative to the status of that plant may actually impact the effect of that application on those plants. And so there might be some, well, there's definitely research that could be done of the timing effect. I'm not really going to talk about where to from here. I've, I've said more than enough for today. Other than where this lab is going is really coming back to this idea of trying to figure out how plants actually live their lives. And we're trying to move away just from what a plant is and its component parts to how does the decisions of that plant depend on its environment and how does the decisions of the one individual impact the other individuals in that system. So we're reframing living with neighbors away from a competitive process to competition being one potential outcome but you can also show avoidance, and you can also show other behavioral strategies that should scale up to coexistence and other community processes. So we do think that individual behavior is going to be inextricably intertwined with larger scale outcomes. We think this is going to be important in terms of understanding the maintenance of biodiversity if plants have the ability to express fine habitat use. We know that's true in animals. We know that fine detailed changes in habitat use have a lot of consequences on the landscape greater than the individual. We expect that to be true for plants. We just don't know what they are. And so that's where a lot of research has to come. I'll end with the standard acknowledgments. Uh, of course, to thank um, NSERC and a variety of other funding sources. But uh, more than anything else, there have been a lot of students over the years who've worked on this and postdocs and colleagues um, around the world. Um, working with roots is tedious. And so it does take a great deal of um, patience and perseverance and uh, my work and um, their work has uh, greatly benefited from that. So I'll stop there, and I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. So one of the, I, I haven't noticed them doing that other than the diurnal cycle. Um, one of the other predictions out there has been that this is a water conservation mechanism and that if it's really windy, they should close up their leaves so there'd be less um, evaporation. I've, the, my field work in Florida, I've been, I would sit in the bush with mimosa right there and the wind would be howling just and these leaves would be going like this and they'd be wide open. I would stick out a finger and touch it and they'd close right away. And so doesn't seem to be this background level of disturbance forces a touch. It's, it's when there's a change to what they're normally experiencing. Um, we do know you can, if you apply temperature, that will cause them to close. So the physiologists did do, how can we make, they, close, they add cocaine, does that change things? Like they do all these crazy things. Uh, and so they have some deals with that, but in natural systems, not other than touch, which is often wind, we haven't seen anything. So there's one paper showing acclimation um, in, in, or desensitization. Um, we don't find it. And so we are, our stimuli treatment are very different. The one study that is showing it, she took pots and she would drop them. And repeatedly she had made a machine to drop a pot, drop a pot. So it's a pretty extreme and I'd like to say non-realistic treatment. Um, ours we try to simulate periodic touches that might be more consistent with wind and other things. And so the study that hasn't been done is what's the threshold of touch necessary to get acclimation? Because there probably is some way to reconcile these two things. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so there are some studies that have tried to tease apart self-recognition from kin recognition in plants. Um, I, I alluded briefly in Mimosa that there's an electrical signal in, that involved in electrical transduction and, and uh, a, uh, action potential involved in that. But all plants actually have an electrical uh, periodicity to them. It's very low relative to animals, but, but it's in every plant. 
Um, there is one argument that plants may be able to detect matches and mismatches of the electrical signal as an, a way of self-recognition. Uh, it's not well-replicated work, but it is a nice experiment that is suggesting that. Um, I'm not sure you would expect a different response between self and kin recognition if we think about inclusive fitness. They both should lead to the same outcome, which would be harmless, regardless of whether it's your own root or the root of a, of a close relative. So I, 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 don't, I don't have a clear answer, um, but I'm not sure we would expect a different result, self versus non-self, but it's something to study. Yes. <laughs> It's a fair question. I disagree that sensitive plants are actually um, delicate. Uh, my experience in the field is actually they're very robust. Uh, and you can have a, quite a bit of a damage in a leaf and they still behave quite normally. Uh, um, Mimosa pudica is actually one of the world's most invasive species as well. It's a subpantropical weed. Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily see that consistent with the delicateness argument. But your point is good, is if you have rainfall, I've been there in the rain and they've been wide open, when it gets cloudy, they close up. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of um, constant rain causing the same sort of effect. Uh, that said, what is missing is the field work on the plant. Uh, it's the lab physiologist. My work has mostly been the lab, which is why I'm trying to get to the field to do some. We, we nobody studied the plant with its natural herbivores. I, I think that these are mostly ungulate related, but that's just me making it up based on my observations. Um, I, I, that is absolutely a giant hole in the literature. Well, why develop a larger thorn if you can make the thorn you have look bigger, right? I mean, if, if the outcome is, is the apparency of the thorns, if you have a leaf like this and you have a thorn here, yes, you can make that thorn bigger, or you droop this leaf and the thorn is more visible. And so I think it comes down to the cost of the defense relative to that, that benefit. And if it turns out the drooping of the leaf not only makes this defense more visible, but it also makes it look like less of a quality of food source, you might be getting a, another benefit. And so it requires a weird physiology to be able to do it. And we need more explicit measures of the cost and benefit. But I think we might be able to argue this both ways, but we just need the data to really, to, to measure those costs and benefits. Yes. <laughs> so, so we've done quite a bit with mycorrhizae in the lab. Um, one set of studies, that we did is we used our window boxes. And, and so we show that they make good decisions about nutrient patches versus not nutrient patch. We did those window boxes where instead of patching this with nutrients, we put fungal species that we know give benefit to the plant versus fungal species we know cause harm to the plant. And we asked the question, can plants forage for good mutualists? Can they preferentially put their roots where the good fungus is? And unfortunately, the answer is no. <laughs> and, and so they, grew roots independent of the quality and, the, and they still had an infection. And we, we haven't published that yet, which is, and we haven't followed up on it until it gets published, which is one of the reasons I'm not talking about it. Um, but we have done some other work in the field of looking at soil seedbacks and microbial communities related to some root distributions. And, and it is an important player of the system. Um, it's really complicated. <laughs> And so what we are trying to do right now is simplify the system and build up piece at a time. Uh, we're not unaware of the mycorrhizae, but they, they, aren't, they weren't step one for us to integrate more fully. We're actually looking to do screenings of about 50 species 
for a series of standardized behavioral assays, like old school school screening, uh, where you know just screen people like going into the army of you know behavioral types. So we're looking to do that with a standard battery of tests to see if we can see some behavioral syndromes in plants and a mycorrhizal response is included in those batteries because it is obviously very important. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't talk about it, but it moved into this triplet. And so a funny thing happened when you cut off the leaves. Um, you got this, uh, exactly, it was a 24 hour cycle of, of root pulses and recision. Um, and re we haven't quite figured it out. That diurnal cycle though is in the undamaged plants too. There's a significant effect of triplets in that too. It's just buried by the overall trend. And so what we think is going on is that these plants have a natural diurnal cycle of root growth but the um, signal of nutrient patch versus background is greater and it o outweighs the diurnal cycle. When you disrupt it, it flips to its internal. Like when we, we never were expecting that. And unfortunately, the timing of our measures weren't perfect for disentangling a diurnal cycle. And so we can't go too far in it in that experiment, but it's definitely an area that we're following up on. Any other questions as well? Yeah. It is, it is an area that people are talking about. So the colonial animals and then also swarming, so, you, or bees, beehives and sorts of things where you have sort of distributed function among genetically related components. That's currently where, my lab isn't doing the modeling of it, but that's currently where some of the labs are trying to adapt those modeled systems to plant biology. I will say they haven't progressed very far um, and it's only in the last couple of years, but that's definitely like the closest we can think of would be something like that. Um, but I, my take is that's not your typical animal behavior study system either. And so the behavioral information from those systems isn't as robust as the solitary animal sort of system. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>